that's a great uh, anatomy talk and uh, a good place to start. So let's have a look at the ways that and the technologies that we've got now in this uh, 2018 to assess left ventricular size and function. Uh, always um, uh, when you have these kind of conversations, uh, you lead in with an anatomy talk and then talk about how we get the imaging uh, and what access we have to get the imaging from windows and, and uh, tomographic slices, four chamber, two chamber, long axis and so on. So in echo, which is probably the entry level uh, imaging for most people, we, we uh, take our imaging uh, usually from the outside of the chest. And our key imaging ports are places where the heart is closest to the, to the skin, where there's very little lung and where you get the best uh, contact and uh, uh, sound wave transmission. So parasternal, up, up near the roof of the heart. Apical, obviously, down from the ventricle, ventricles looking up. Now remember, the apical views are available to us because when you lie a person on the left side, the apex virtually touches the, touches the ribs. And so that uh, gets lung out of the way and makes for best contact. Subcostal is good, particularly when people have emphysema and bad lungs. And that, in general, are you looking up through the liver. And sometimes we use suprasternal views, mostly for the great vessels. Remember that the lingo goes that we, we talk about the, the axis of the hearts in terms of long axis, and this is a standard now for, all, for everybody who discusses hearts even in other modalities, short axis in, in orthogonal to these long axis views. Now in terms of chambers, when you're trying to explain this to people, chambers are obviously chambers uh, for uh, two ventricles and two atriums, but the aorta is referred to a chamber in these views, hence the three chamber and five chamber views. So let's start with that most basic of images, the parasternal long axis view, and this is the entry level where most people will have their first view. Now, this parasternal long axis view, as taken by Echo, is, as you know, tomographic, and is taken as if you are standing at the person's left armpit, so that even though the imaging, the actual microphone is in parasternal space, you're looking from the left side. So the sternum is up here, the head is up here, the feet are down here, and, the, and this is the descending aorta. So get in your mind as you take that picture, the perspective. And let's put that perspective next to a CAT scan. So this is the, the tomographic slice, and these, uh, this uh, dovetails in very well with Sean's talk. This is the tomographic slice of a parasternal long axis view. If you could put your finger into the TV here, you would be touching the ventricular septum. And when you activate Live 3D, this is the same picture, the parasternal long axis view with the septum and the, and the infralateral wall here, but this surface just in there, if you're touching that, that's the ventricular septum. And so you know that in terms of perspective that you're standing in the person's left axilla to do that. Always remember that uh, there are structures outside the heart which can give you landmarks, in particular the descending aorta and often the vertebrae here. And in fact, often the left atrium in the bigger, in the bigger left atria is actually touching the vertebral column. But take that parasternal long axis view and left to right invert it, as I've done here on the CT scan and I've done here on the picture. Same picture, same parasternal long axis. And if you now, uh, by inverting that, you're now standing in the person's right axilla. And so if you put your finger into the TV of this picture and touch that wall there, then that's the lateral wall of the left ventricle. So try and, in your mind, uh, dovetail the 2D tomographic slices that you're getting with the 3D anatomy. When you turn the transducer square to the long axis, you get the short axis, obviously. And this picture, uh, these pictures are always taken in transthoracic echo as if you're standing at the feet. So you're looking at the, from the apex of the heart up and the, the lateral portion of the, of the heart, which is left atrial appendage and so on, is to the right of you here. And the medial portion of the heart and the ventricle is to your left. And you know it's medial because anything that's got RV in it, by definition, is to the medial and anything that's got the left atrial appendage and so on is to the lateral. Let's have a look at that picture in comparison to the CAT scan now. And so this descending aorta, which if you look at this, and in many a person will be, on, and it's a bit cut off here, but often is, is tubular at below the short axis, is almost completely at right angles uh, to, the, uh, to the short axis of the left ventricle. You have two pap muscles, which we learned some new names for today, anterolateral and posteromedial, but I would encourage you just to even simplify that and just call them respectively lateral and medial. It's just too complicated. And at the end of the day, all we have to know is that at the lateral end of the mitral valve and, and lateral side of the heart, or the medial. Lateral, of course, being supplied by the circ and uh, the circumflex and the medial supplied by the right. Tipping that parasternal uh, short axis views, you can get 
uh, going southwards and northwards, you can get other cuts outside of the left ventricular cavity. Then if you move the probe down to the apex, obviously you get a four chamber view and let's have a look how that slices. So the four chamber view is again taken from the feet. All transthoracic echo, you should imagine that you're standing with your perspective as if you're looking from the feet, as with CAT scans and MRI. And so in this, in this view, the left ventricle is to your right on the television and the right ventricle to your left. And if you could put your finger into the television there, you would be touching the, uh, the uh, anterior wall of the heart. And so to put it in perspective here with the CAT scan, you've got there's the vertebral column there, this is vertebral column here, and many a time on these big hearts, you can actually see the back of the left atrium uh, indented. And in fact, just as an aside for those who use a stethoscope, if you've got severe mitral regurgitation and your atrium is touching your vertebral column on the echo, you'll be able to hear the murmur in the back. If you tilt nor northwards from that same apical view, you will bring in the aorta, which is what we refer to as the fifth chamber, obviously not a chamber, but the fifth chamber, hence the five chamber view, but also again, taken from the feet. And there are other, obviously ro with rotation, two chamber and three chamber views to be had. Two chamber view uh, here is looking basically from the left side. And if you watch here, the descending aorta is again perpendicular to the two chamber view and is often tubular in this picture. Now, transesophageal echo, same picture, same four chamber view, is actually taken from above. And so in this view, which is upside down uh, to the last one on uh, to the transthoracic, uh, is taken as if you're standing at the head because the spine is over here and the descending aorta is over here where the P is there, the esophagus is obviously just there. Uh, and so your perspective for transesophageal echo is exactly opposite. So there's the anatomy. Now how do we measure uh, the function and the dimensions of the heart? Well everybody knows about ejection fraction and it's a stock standard measurement which just about all of cardiology operates on. And originally it was measured from 2D and, uh, sorry, from M mode and other ways. But Simpson taught us that basically if you get the volume of the left ventricle, which they calculated originally by measuring uh, lots of different coin state shapes, stacks there, and integrating them uh, using the tracing the black-white interface, you would end up with a volume such that if the volume of your heart when it was full was 87 milliliters, for example, and when it's empty, it ejects down to 31 milliliters, then your ejection fraction is the big volume minus the little volume divided by what you started with. So in this case, 64%, very straightforward. But it's got some functional limitations and it's particularly operator dependent. It's really operator dependent on basically the uh, black-white interface. It's also dependent on the fact that you have to be able to track for regional wall motion variability using the language of hypokinetic for a partially contracting segment, akinetic for a non-contracting segment, and dyskinetic for a segment which is contracting, or, or sorry, expanding while the rest of the heart is contracting. No, no. So The Simpsons is not perfect. That was Bonita Anderson who gave me that slide. <laughs> she likes The Simpsons. So sometimes it, you can't quite see the heart and uh, particularly I, I would challenge anybody in the room to be able to get some uh, useful information out of that. So we are now able to inject these, uh, these uh, compounds, so-called uh, echo contrast, Definity, uh, and Sonovist and so on. And these tiny uh, gas-filled bubbles will go through from a, a venous injection through the lungs, they don't get sieved out by the lungs, and will opacify the left ventricle and turn uh, a fuzzy picture like you just saw into a very clear picture. There is a finite cost, which is not insignificant associated with this and very low side effect rates, and we use it for people where we really just can't get a picture. But as you can see, all that 2D stuff makes some assumptions and it makes assumptions about the, the shape of the heart and what's happening between the two slices. And, it, and basically the 2D uh, numbers that we get are guesstimating all the walls between the, the, the four chamber and the two chamber view. But what if you could track all of them? And obviously, as you know, all the scanners can do this now, where you can acquire the whole volume of the heart and generate a, a basically semi-automated border detection of the volume of the heart. This uh, blob here is called a butel, and it is giving you uh, basically a four chamber, a three chamber, a two chamber, and every single chamber in between, uh, all the walls in between by rendering uh, the walls uh, and curve fitting. And it generates a shape that looks like this. And I was talking this morning in the, in the workshop that all traces in cardiology are the same, and that is they have a systolic deflection and then an E wave relax and then an A wave relax. Hearts contract linearly and then let go with an E wave and an A wave. And so if you watch any trace in, in cardiology and all in, also in the cath lab, you'll see that same trace. 
Tom Marwick's group, uh, uh, and, and uh, sorry, the guidelines have told us that 3D echo is probably better than uh, 2D, and Tom Marwick's group um, some years ago, Carly Jenkins did her PhD and showed that uh, the 3D volumes were closest to the MRI, which is said to be the gold standard. So that's all about edge detecting the uh, chamber, but what if we could actually measure the actual contraction of every single muscle cell in the heart? And so what if we could tell the fractional compression or the fractional shortening, and I'm not going to use that word anymore now, but the fractional loss of length of each part. And I'm going to tell you that it works out that all human heart muscle contracts by about 20% during systole. So if you look at a whole heart, it gets 20% shorter. If you look at one centimetre of the heart, it gets 20% shorter, say eight millimetres. And so it turns out that human hearts basically get shorter by 20%. So what if we could look at each individual part? Let's have a look what happens to this heart. This is a whole heartbeat now. So the heart starts at 100% of itself, and, and, the, and the computer refers to this as 0, 0.0, and shortens by 20% in systole. As I said, linear contraction. And that takes some energy, sorry, that takes some energy and some myocytes contracting and so on, and actin and myosin shortening. Then the heart relaxes as the as systole is over and the mitral valve opens and blood f rushes on in to the mitral valve like these commuters on the uh, Japanese subway sort of wandering on in with the mitral valve. Then once the, the, uh, that first early rush of activity occurs, the heart is sort of full and the muscle has relaxed about 15 of those 20%. And so not much action or filling of the chamber at this stage quite taken by how optimistic this lady is, <laughs> keeps trying. And then at that last bit, in the last bit of the diastole, that last 5% of contraction is let go of and atrium contracts. <laughs> and if you just watch this lady, this is the atrium trying to contract, push the last bit in, she goes back up the pulmonary vein. <laughs> so that's a normal heartbeat. Linear contraction of about 20%, let go by 15 for your E-wave, let go by the last five for your A-wave. And so on average, if you look at that bullseye there, and those numbers are all percents, that top uh, androceptum contracts by 19%, this bit by 22%, this bit by 19%. And so this is now regional contractility. And the whole thing, when you average it out, is supposed to be about 20 to 22%, and that's called GLS, Global Longitudinal Strain. And that is going to become a standard, it already is, a standard now for measuring heart function, not by volume now, but by muscle wall thin, uh, uh, shortening, and particularly pertinent to the chemotherapy people who are now setting their dosing based on these GLS numbers. Don't forget good old M modes, sometimes they're all we could get back in the day, and sometimes even now, are these sorts of pictures here, and using co complicated formulas, you can get some measure of LV function, so-called um, uh, the Tycholtz method and also fractional shortening and so on, which will give you ejection fraction. Moving forward now to other technologies and other speakers are going to speak about this, but MRI clearly is the gold standard. It has the advantage of a crystal clear pixel quality. It has the disadvantage that it's a great big scanner that you can't wheel up to ICU and that every time you go in there, your watch gets sucked off your arm and puts up against the machine. But other than that, a beautiful piece of equipment and we're going to learn about this. This is the gold standard, but it does the exact same thing. And that is it edge tracks the endocardium to get a volume in systole and diastole and give you these sorts of maps. What about nuclear medicine? Well, nuclear medicine definitely has a place still in imaging of the left ventricle. Sestamibi and other traces are very good at assessing perfusion. Heart muscle takes up these traces very well. And so typically these myocardial perfusion scans show that the left ventricle, let's have a look at this picture here of a left ventricle, is bright orange when you are sitting there quietly. But when you exercise, there's a great big bite taken out of this heart in the LAD territory here. It's blue, that would be a reversible perfusion defect or a positive myocardial perfusion scan. But there's other places now for radionucleotide and nuclear medicine, in particular with the use of PET scan. So PET scan is radioactive sugar and you have to go nil by mouth for a while so that your, your, your body and particularly your heart cells are starving for sugar and then they give you radioactive sugar for, um, uh, F16, sorry, F18 labelled uh, sugar, and then they inject this stuff. And if you and remember that the heart is a very metabolically active organ, but in particular, if you have some conditions like sarcoid, that th those sarcoid cells within the heart will light up like a Christmas tree, 
and take up the uh, FDP. So certainly there's a, a nuclear medicine role there for that left ventricle and also for this, and we'll talk about this in the next talk, but basically bone scanning markers will be taken up by the left ventricle in amyloid. So to summarise, ventricular anatomy is imaged very well by all the technologies. So by ultrasound, MRI and CT. Echo is particularly good because it's got a high frame rate and its temporal resolution is excellent. Nuclear medicine offers insights into metabolism and tissue character. And now in this day and age, we all should be able to read these multimodality approaches so we can get a comprehensive diagnosis. Thanks very much. Thank you.